Hare Krishna. So today we continue our discussion on the overview of the Bhagavad Gita and we have to do four chapters today so I'll try to do 15, 16 probably in 20, 20 minutes 15, 16, 17 in 20 minutes and then maybe 40 minutes for the 18th chapter and then we will have some questions of course if there are some short questions along the way after each chapter also we can discuss that so chapters 12 and 15 are the shortest chapters in the Bhagavad Gita both of them have 20 verses and chapter 15 is also one of the most important chapters in the sense that it is often a chapter that is recited frequently before Gita recitation and so it is called Purushottam Yoga now interestingly we will see that several of these chapters start without any direct question by Arjun. Now it's not that now when we recite the Bhagavad Gita we often say that Ataha Panchamo Adhyayaha Atha Pancha Dasho Adhyayaha When Krishna and Arjuna was speaking Krishna was not now I have completed the chapter now I am going to start a new chapter. It's a normal conversation. The chapter division has been made by Vyasadeva later. So that is made based on the broad themes. So like I said Krishna is taking this opportunity, Arjuna is taking the opportunity to address various, to ask various questions and Krishna is also taking the opportunity to clarify various concepts even if those concepts are not specifically being asked by Arjuna but related with that. So basically the last chapter, six chapters are talking about how to move through the various concepts of Jnana, of the Jnana Marga uh, and to move toward Bhakti. So now in the 15th chapter, Krishna addresses a new theme and the theme is that how are the material world and the spiritual world related. So in the 14th chapter, Krishna talked about how the material world is a place of entanglement and the spiritual world uh, is what we need to attain by becoming disentangled. So then the question remains, okay, so the material world is what we have to give up and go there. But then is there any relationship between the material and the spiritual world? And how is how are we to see the material and deal with the material while moving toward the spiritual? So that is the overall theme of this chapter. How are the material and the spiritual worlds related? And of course the chapter is called the Purushottam Yoga. The Yoga of the Supreme Person as Prabhupada translates it. What that means is that Supreme Person is not just the Lord of the <coughs> spiritual world. He is the lord of the spiritual world and the material world. So, maybe we can write down, somebody can write like yesterday, if possible. Of course, I can just dictate it also and you can write it if you like, whichever way it works out. So, verses 1 to 5 talk about how the material world is a reflection of the spiritual world and the famous metaphor is used of the upside down tree so i'll just go over the overview and then we can talk about how the material world is a reflection of the spiritual world is one to five then six to ten is how the soul struggles in the material world. Then 11 to 15 is so 6 to 10 is how the soul struggles in the material world. Then 11 to 15 is how the material can point to the spiritual how we can look at the material world but then find that we can perceive the spiritual level of reality how the material points to the spiritual that's 11 to 15 and then 16 to 20 <coughs> how all knowledge 
culminates in the supreme spiritual person how all knowledge culminates culminates it attains its supremacy attains its zenith culminates in the supreme spiritual person purushottam that's the broad overview of this chapter so the the thread of thought going on is in the 13th chapter krishna talked about okay you're completed man so broadly we could say there are four divisions of this chapter how the material world is a reflection of the spiritual world how we struggle in the material world how the material can point to the spiritual and how all knowledge material and spiritual ultimately points to the not just some vague spiritual conception but the supreme spiritual reality so within this let's look at the first section <clears throat> we had yesterday i took the metaphor of does anyone remember, what are the main metaphor i took from 13th chapter does anyone remember how the soul is entangled based on 1322 purusha prakriti sthohi bhungte prakriti jan gunan yeah be it's a bija vakya but what are the what are the example or metaphor for explaining yes watching a movie yes watching a movie so now there are different metaphors used to explain the nature of illusion so one metaphor that is often used is like a dream in the bhagavatam humne said that the world we live in is like a dream mm-hmm. so another metaphor is used it's a reflection so another metaphor is that it's a sleep is a famous song sung by bhakti nath thakur about sleep what is that song jeev jago jeev jago so the idea is that there are div- the whole point is that this world is in some way not the full reality and there is some reality beyond this world so how do we understand this this so there are different metaphors which are used <clears throat> and thinkers across various traditions have come up with some ideas even in today's world also there are movies like matrix any of you heard of that movie mm-hmm. some of you so that's a talk about maybe our whole world is like a, a virtual reality created by someone mm-hmm. and we are lost in that so the idea that the world we live in is not exactly the real world or at least not the complete world that there's something beyond it that is there in various schools of thought even science also talks about this idea that you know we have a particular world that we see with our senses but the world of quantum physics we can't see it with our eyes so this is so now there are different ways in which we can understand that this point of unreality so let's look at the metaphor that is given over here in the 15th chapter let's recite the first verse shri bhagavan together shri bhagavan uvacha urdhva moolam mada shakam ashvatham prahuravyam chandam siyasya paranani yastam vedas vedavet so vedavit is the knower of the vedas who one who understands this tree now clearly the vedas are not a book on botany <laughs> is it <isn't> it <laughs> so one who understand this three knows the vedas krishna is not referring to literal knowledge of some tree over here krishna is referring to the tree as a metaphor for something else and the strangeness of this tree is that urdhva moolam adashakam it's upside down now prabhupad says in a lecture that if something is uh, if somebody suspended upside down they are not very comfortable so like that he says we are not very comfortable in the material world and that's a simplified explanation of this verse but the point is that Urdu, uh, when krishna talks about this he does not literally use the word reflection anywhere in the section hmm? but that's a inference that we can draw because where do we see an upside down tree that's in a reflection if, a, if there is a river and there's a tree and we see the tree reflected in the river so the idea is there are three distinct points that you can draw from this if there is a reflection there must be a reality of which there is a reflection otherwise there cannot be any reflection secondly is that 
there must be some observer who is looking at the reflection instead of the reality. How do we know something is a reflection? You know, unless somebody is looking at it, the reflection might exist. But okay, I'm looking at the reflection, and I look at the reality. I understand. If I'm looking at the reflection and don't look at the reality, I might be caught in it. And there must be something in which the reflection is taking place, isn't it? If the object is there. How can the object be reflected unless there is something? Say, if we see our reflection in the mirror, the mirror is an object. Something has to be there. So the point of all this is that. This metaphor itself points to the illusion of the the monistic idea that everything is one. That this metaphor is often used to talk about how this world is illusion, Brahma Satya Jagan Mitya. Well, that's not exactly true unless we redefine what is Brahman. A Brahman is, if we consider that to be simply the Brahma Jyoti, then that's just not true because, okay. If this world is like a reflection, who is observing the reflection? Something apart from Brahman is observing the reflection. Then there is a reality which is reflected over here. That means something about the reflection must be there in the reality. Otherwise, how does the reflection come? And there has to be something in which it is reflected. So uh, the Vedic, uh, the the Vedantic understanding of Brahma is that Brahma is not just the spiritual effulgence. Brahman is the absolute truth. With material and spiritual energies, both. So Prabhupada writes in the Nectar of Devotion introduction that Krishna doesn't just refer to the person Krishna. Krishna refers to Krishna with all his expansions and energies together. He is the absolute truth. So now Krishna develops this metaphor further, and just like if you have a tree and say it's an unwanted tree, that means it's a tree which. Is like there are some trees which are like weeds which have overgrown and become huge trees. So just like weeds want need to be cut, so like that this is an unwanted tree. Now when we see an unwanted tree, <coughs> we look at several things. First is now how is this tree growing? A tree needs some water. A tree needs to have roots, and the root need, roots need to be watered. So another thing is if we want to cut the tree, we can't just push and cut the tree. We need an axe to cut the tree. That's how Krishna develops the metaphor, and he says that this tree is is watered by the three modes of material nature. So, what does it mean that this tree will grow depending on how the modes are nourished? How we, if we act in a particular mode accordingly, the tree grows in that direction, and once it grows in that direction, it just keeps growing, growing, growing. And then, how do we need an axe to cut it? That axe is the axe of detachment. Asanga shastre na drudhe na chitva. So then, asanga shastre na with the weapon of detachment. So the um, to the extent we are attached to material things, purusha prakriti stohi, bhunte prakriti jan gunan, karanam guna. Sangosya. Thirteen twenty-two had the word sang, and here fifteen point. Can you go to four? Fifteen four has the word asang. So just like how ma how if a person is watching a movie, the more they watch the movie, the more they get captivated and deluded. But as soon as they stop watching the movie, their delusion goes away. If they decide I don't want to watch it, then gradually, even if it's a horror movie which has been going on and on, they're horrified. But if they stop watching it, Then, gradually, the effect of the horror will start going down. So, sanga is what entangles. Asanga is what disentangles. Asanga shastre na, drudhe na chitwa. Now, this theme that the tree has to be cut. Now, every metaphor has its uh, context. So, the point is that it's not that the tree will ever get cut, but rather our entanglement with the tree will get cut. Suppose we are watching a movie. Now we decide I don't want to watch the movie. It's not that we have to go and destroy the TV. Mm-hmm. And okay, I stop. I don't want to watch the TV anymore. So like that, we can't destroy the material world. We can't end the material entanglement of everyone. But what we can do is we can disentangle ourselves. And it's interesting. Right in the beginning, only Krishna says that after you become disentangled, as fourteen point the fifteen point five, he says, then that's not enough. तथा पदम तत्परिमार्गितव्यम 
yasmin gatan nivartanti bhuya once you go that world from which you never come back and there tameva chadyam purusham prapadye then surrender to that person yata pravrti prasuta purani from whom this whole world has manifested so the point krishna is making here is that actually the just liberation from the material world is not the perfection it is after getting liberated we have to surrender to the one from whom the whole world has come that is the supreme person so then krishna says what is the process for surrender he talks about in 15.5 so broadly speaking the first five verses are talk first is are talking about the spirit the, the supreme lord and sixth sixth verse talks about how there is a spiritual abode the whole theme is that the material world and the spiritual world how how are they related so the material world is a reflection now from the reflection from the reality comes the reflection so what is that reality that is described in 156 you recite that together natad bhasayate suryo na shashanko na pavaka यद्गत्वानिवर्तन्ते तद्धाम परमं मम सो नतद् भासयते सूर्यो सो इट्स इंटरेस्टिंग कृष्णा इज डिस्क्राइबिंग दैट स्पिरिचुअल वर्ल्ड एंड देन वी विल सी लेटर ही विल कंट्रास्ट दैट विद द मटेरियल वर्ल्ड दैट इज सेल्फ ल्यूमिनस इट डज नॉट रिक्वायर एनी हीट लाइट और इलेक्ट्रिसिटी बट इट इज सेल्फ ल्यूमिनस एंड इफ यू अटेन दैट यू विल नॉट कम बैक टू मी यू विल नॉट कम बैक टू दिस वर्ल्ड and krishna has identified this is my abode now but we are not there right now so it's like there somebody is watching a movie and they tell okay if you stop watching the movie what do you have is there something attractive which you can do oh this is this beautiful self luminous world where you can be so if you if you don't stop watching if you don't stop watching the movie then what is going to happen that is described in the next verses so krishna is talking about how first he gives the goal of disentanglement of the reality that is there and if we don't accept that reality then how we stay entangled so the next verses talk about how we are parts of krishna but we have become apart from krishna so 157 is a well known verse so i summarize this verse as be a part be not apart <laughs> we are a part a part of krishna but we should not be apart from krishna we unfortunately become apart from krishna so manah shashthan indriyani prakriti sthani karshati the senses drag us here there and everywhere in the material world and that is our predicament that is our trap no matter what we do the senses are very powerful <coughs> and getting entangled disentangled from the senses it's not easy senses and the mind of course manah shashtha indriyani so the idea is the point here is that uh, we may say there are so many people who don't seem to be just slaves to their senses so many people who may not devote be devoted also they seem to be well disciplined they seem to be hard working they seem to be nice people they're not just like gross gross sense gratifiers yes that may be true but everybody is driven by their mental conceptions now some mental conceptions might be better than others if somebody has a conception that okay you know i want to collect uh, people have all kinds of hobbies i want to collect some shells and i want to have a collection of sea shells somebody has a, i want to collect coins you know, i was once going for a did i mention this about the nail bag incident here okay so what happened i was in a i was going from mumbai to pune i was in a train and i saw somebody is standing over there ahead and they had a bead bag in their hands but i noticed the bead bag was the left hand so i was a little surprised maybe they they chat left i thought i said hari i said hari krishna it is nice to see a uh, devotee he said hari krishna uh, so i said, when were you introduced to krishna he says what krishna consciousness <laughs> oh really he says then what are you doing with this bead bag he says bead bag it's not bead bag it's my nail bag he says what do you nail nail bag? he said that I want to win the Guinness book of, I want to enter the Guinness Book of World Record for the longest nail in the world. So he had like a long nail and he had to keep it he had kept it in the bead bag. He keep not in the bead bag in the nail bag. And I could see that you know he was 
more careful of his nail bag than we will be of our bead bag. <laughs> <laughs> And then finally, maybe I just about two years ago, it might be the same person, it might be a different person, but it was a, this is a person from Pune who won that award. So that was probably 10, 12 years ago I'd met him. But anyway, what happened after that? Two, three, so the news was not that he won the record, but after he won the record, then he decided to cut the nail. But when he cut the nail, what happened? Because he had not used that left hand for so many years. He can't use, if one like nail is so long, you can't use the left hand. So his hand became atrophied because of disuse and he could no longer use the hand itself. So now we may not think of this as a harmful thing but it's just a mental conception and different people are driven by their own mental conceptions. So manaha shashtani indriyani and for fulfilling our mental conceptions we often struggle so much trying to get this or get that. And then Krishna talks about how we stay entangled, he says the soul goes from one body to another body and then soul gets particular senses according to its desires. That means the soul might, uh, the soul has a, like Prabhupada soul has a desire to eat a critical kind of food. Somebody wants to eat meat and the soul gets a tiger body, tiger's body so that it can have the nails and the teeth so that it can eat. So Krishna says that in the, can you go to the ninth verse? So, Shotram Chakshu Sparshanam Cha. Rasanam Granam Evacha, the soul gets the appropriate senses <coughs> to enjoy the material world. And in this way, the soul stays bound. Now, the soul thinks I am enjoying, the soul is governed. Can you go to 10th text? 10th text. That the soul is things I am enjoying, but the soul is bound. Vimudha Nanupashanti. Nanupashanti means is unable to see because one is deluded. So, what happens is, as, as long as we are bound, we, uh, as long as we, we are bound, we will try to free ourselves. But if we don't realize we are bound, then we will not try to free ourselves. So that's how what happens to the soul is the whole thing. I am free. I am going to enjoy this. I am going to enjoy that. I am going to enjoy that. But the soul stays bound, and we mudha nanu. We can't even see the bondage because it is invisible. But then, Pashanti Jnana Chakshushaha, with the eyes of knowledge we can see. And then the next section talks about what the eyes of knowledge are. He says the eyes of knowledge are, we see that, some people say there is nothing beyond the material world. That all that exists is matter. Okay, that could be one way of looking at it. But, they say there is no such thing as consciousness. Only matter exists. But to say that there is no such thing as consciousness, that itself requires consciousness. The denial of consciousness requires consciousness. It's like suppose you have a notice board on which there are 20 notices. And there's one notice over there. All the notices on this notice board are false. Is there any problem with that? that Sorry? You're denying the existence of that notice itself, or the truthfulness of that notice as well. The first notice is false as well. Yeah. yeah, if all the notices are false, then that notice is also false, isn't it? All notices on this uh, notice board are false. So similarly, when people say there's nothing except matter existing, mm -hmm. then who is saying that nothing except matter exists? See, matter exists, but matter doesn't say whether it exists or it doesn't exist. It just exists. So consciousness is required to even acknowledge or to claim that consciousness doesn't exist. So there's a philosopher who said that materialism is the philosophy of the philosopher who has forgotten the philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> you do all kinds of philosophy but you forget that there is a conscious being who is doing the philosophy. So materialism is itself not very a reasonable idea. So, so if we are a little obs observant, we start thinking that our very existence requires something beyond us for our existence. And what is that beyond? Krishna says, he points that out to us. So in the next four <laughs> verses from 12 to 15, he'll talk about how, I said the section is, how the material points to the spiritual. So if we have jnana chakshu, if you have the eyes of knowledge, then we will see. We need light. We need light to look at the world around us, to observe, otherwise we can't function without light. So that light, Krishna says, is what uh, comes from me. Now, 
nowadays people are often so or shall i say lacking in consciousness if you ask a child where does milk come from milk comes from the refrigerator <laughs> okay it comes from the refrigerator but where does it come in the refrigerator form most people don't think that it will come from a cow so similarly where does light come from well it comes from the switch it doesn't literally come from the switch we could say it can come from the power plant but where does it come in the power plant from ultimately the source of all energy is the sun so krishna if you see 15 uh, 12 and earlier there was 15 6 15 said that there is in the spiritual world there is no sun sunlight moonlight or fire that is required but here these are required and where do these come from krishna says i provide these that means it is by krishna's arrangement the sun gives light so it is krishna who has set up the system by which we can maintain ourselves now of course we have to maintain ourselves but our maintaining efforts are only secondary in the sense that if it's we are in deep dark in a deep dark dungeon we can't see the sun so if you want light we have to come out of the dungeon but even after coming out of the dungeon it's not that uh, we produce the light we just reach the light so so this is the cosmic level the next verse krishna talks about of the earth level how the earth is floating in space and that is krishna says because of me gama avishya ch bhutani i maintain the earth in its orbit now somebody will say it's a gravity which maintains the earth okay that's okay but where does gravity come from gravity is just a name for an existing phenomena it's not a explanation it's a name okay how 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 do planets float is by gravity but where does how does one object exert one celestial object exert some force on some other object which is millions of miles away there is some mechanism which already existing and scientists have only found the mechanism they have not created that mechanism so we might use a name uh, gravity for it but actually it's not an explanation in the sense of it's not explaining the origin so the scientific explanation and the spiritual explanation can go in parallel it's not that the two are contradictory it's just like if say some there is nice prasadam after this program and then if you ask how, how who made this then you may say okay so and so person made this okay how was it made now how was it made that is telling the ingredients telling how the, the recipe basically now the knowledge of the recipe does not contradict with the knowledge of the cook the cook and the recipe exist together so we could say gravity is like the recipe but oh yeah but who is it that is actually making it happen there has to be an arrangement behind it so both of them move together and then uh, like this krishna talks about various sections and then he talks about the stomach and how we digest food so now of course one common saying is <coughs> that you know if i i don't work is your prayer going to put food on your table well even if food comes on the table <coughs> after food goes inside the mouth now who is digesting it the only time we think about our digestion is when it doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> but it's not something which we consciously make it work somehow it works so all that krishna is maintaining it and then lastly krishna says that it is not only do i maintain these particular mechanisms but it is i who give knowledge remembrance and forgetfulness and that's how we move forward so for whatever functioning we do in our lives whether it is material knowledge or the spiritual knowledge it is krishna who gives us that and then toward the end of this chapter he talks about how there is the this is what is being pointed towards by all the vedic knowledge so the vedic knowledge uh, that krishna earlier said veda with in 15:1 that one who knows the tree is a knower of the vedas but what is the point of knowing the tree it is to know that i have to get out of the tree and attain the real world so the last five verses talk about how we as souls uh, can understand the nature of reality that there is <laughs> there is the there are two kinds of beings there is the finite conscious being and there is the infinite conscious being and for the soul who is finite to love the infinite that is life's ultimate perfection 
can you go to the 19th text you, you, 19th yo let's recite this together yo mam eva asam mudho janati purushottamam sa sarva ved bhajati mam sarva bhavena bharata so one who sarva bhavena bharata one who wholeheartedly devotes oneself to the lord that is the person who is sa sarva ved the person has having complete knowledge knowledge of the vedas and knowledge beyond the vedas all kind of knowledge is there is one who becomes devoted to krishna so that is the theme of the 15th chapter uh, any quick questions about this okay let's go to the 16th chapter now now if we consider what is going on here the 15th chapter talk about this tree of material existence now every tree begins from a seed the seed was 1322 where it is said that purusha prakriti stohi a soul because of the desire to enjoy gets caught in the material world and that's why the soul goes up or down the soul the whole material world ex- expands so then what is happening over here krishna says that okay on this tree there are two extremes there is the divine nature and the demoniac nature so that division that means on the tree like you remember what i said that, that the modes nourish the tree so if a person lives in goodness somebody is wa- hooked to watching tv but some people might be ho- some people might be hooked to watching say discovery channel and just getting some good information and some people might be is hooked to watching obscenity and violence and things like that so all the both are watching tv is still there's a categorical difference between it so krishna is saying there is godly nature there is ungodly nature so if you consider this tree there is the upper part of the tree there is a lower part of the tree the characteristics of the godly and ungodly that is what described in this 16th chapter so 16th chapter a quick overview we can do so we have text 1 to 3 is godly qualities then so 1 to 3 is godly qualities then there's a different different ways to classify this but we could just go shortly from 4 onwards till 20 krishna talks about demoniac qualities activities and mentalities quality activity mentality and then 21 to 24 is broadly about choosing between the godly and ungodly paths choosing between the godly and the ungodly paths there are 24 verses in this chapter broadly speaking so what is going on in this chapter first krishna talks about the godly qualities abhayam sattva samshuddhi jnana yoga vyavasthiti talks it gives a various list of beautiful qualities which are characterizing the godly now this godly and ungodly can be seen in different ways that in the krishna doesn't mention bhakti in any of these directly so krishna is talking about material nature now those who are in the godly nature they can easily be elevated they can practice bhakti very easily but it need not necessarily be that they are devotees and those who are ungodly they they are demoniac so usually would say they are the opposite of devotees but krishna is not specifically focused krishna is here analyzing material nature not so much teaching bhakti he will go toward bhakti later but right now is analyzing material nature and now we will go through a few verses over here let's look at 167 pravrittim we can recite together pravrittim cha nevrittim cha शौचम नाचाचारो न सत्यम तेषु विद्य सो प्रवृत्ति निवृत्ति डू यू रिमेम्बर ये स्टडी डिस्कस दर्ड प्रवृत्ति कम समेर ये वेरी गुड फॉर द मोड ऑफ पैशन कृष्ण डिस्क्राइब्स थ्री वर्ड्स प्रकाश इज फॉर गुडनेस प्रवृत्ति इज फॉर पैशन एंड मोह इज फॉर इग्नोरेंस सो हियर वेन प्रवृत्ति इज यूज इट इज अ स्लाइटली डिफरेंट सेंस हियर प्रवृत्ति इज नॉट जस्ट लाइक material entanglement but pravritti means the action which should be done nivritti means action which should be given up 
सो प्रवृत्तिम चे निवृत्तिम चे जना न विदुरासुरा the demoniac people do not know this they do not care for it and therefore na chaucham na pichacharo if you don't know what is to be done and what is not to be done then cleanliness they don't follow and then they do not have proper conduct also and na satyam teshu vidyate so satya is as you know truthfulness that the, the, the demoniac they see truth as simply a tool to power that means a for getting power they speak truth it's helpful they will speak the truth if not they will speak something else so their purpose is so the krishna first talks here about the activities and then he goes to the world view the world view is similar to what we mentioned earlier about the atheistic world view which says that there's no god there is no higher reality and this world is all that there is and there's nothing beyond this world and when we live in this way the result of living like this is that they are always dissatisfied why is that because if all our desires are centered on getting material enjoyment only then there is never enough for everyone in this world because the material world desires keep increasing keep increasing keep increasing so the communist idea was that you know, if we take all the wealth away from the wealthy and distribute it among all people equally then everybody will become equally prosperous but it didn't work out like that because what happened was that see people need inspiration people need motivation to work so in every social structure there will be some kind of hierarchy just like in a class if right at the beginning only the teachers tell that everybody is going to get the same marks <laughs> so what do you think will happen if you say everybody will get the same marks good 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 <laughs> sorry Will be empty. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I guess the equal marks are zero. <laughs> Very strict. Hmm? Very strict. <laughs> Sweetly strict. <laughs> yeah, but what do you think will happen if everybody is told in advance you get equal marks? There will be no competition. No. Is that a bad thing? No competition. No interest. No motivation to no study. No one studies. No one studies. Yes see the lazy will anyway stay lazy <laughs> and those who are intelligent they will also become lazy so <laughs> okay i'm not going to get many better marks why should i study so there is always within uh, human beings a desire for excellence and it is that now the desire for excellence itself will create inequality because in any field there is some people who can do better than others So when we talk about equality, the Bhagavad Gita talks about equality at the spiritual level, but not at the material level. At the material level, if we try to implement equality, that means, like, uh, currently now there's a court case going on in Harvard because what happened was they found that the most intelligent students who come in these Ivy League universities are from India and China. and then at a subtle level they were managing things in such a way they wanted to have diversity and inclusion so even children who were from africa or from south america or other countries even if these kids didn't have very good marks still they were given admission and there was one indian in parents indians who settled in there in america so this child had like five cgp you know, the best you can have and it's like impeccable record and still he did not get admission in harvard and then his parents were furious and they said they have made a court case against it so now harvard is trying to defend but they are finding very difficult to defend diversity and uh, explain how it is not discrimination so the point i'm uh, this is, we don't want to wander too much from our discussion but the point here is that <clears throat> in the material world there will always be some kind of inequality and that inequality comes because simply talents are unequally distributed 
and some people have talents in some fields, some people have talents in some other fields. So because of this unequal distribution of talent, there will be inequality. So the way to deal this with inequality is not by denying the existence of unequal talents, but by providing facility uh, for those who are more gifted that they should share things voluntarily. Not that you say, oh, you are better talented. No, you cannot have that. It's not like that. So the demoniac ways can come up in many different ways. So, so why am I talking about this hierarchies? In today's world, we can try to understand what demoniac means. One way of being demoniac is that I am better than everyone else. And because I am better than everyone else, I will crush everyone else. So that's what Krishna will talk about in the 16th chapter when 12, 13, 13, 14, 15 verses, then he says, I'll destroy this person. I'll destroy Idamadhyamaya Asaumpaya Hataha Shatru Anishya Chaparanati. I'll kill this person, I'll kill that person. So hierarchy is something which always exists in the material world. Now, those who are on top in the hierarchy, if they are demonic, then they will crush those who are below them. So that is one way the demonic nature can come up. But the other way the demonic nature may come up is that you say this whole hierarchy itself is bad. So destroy the hierarchy. But when you destroy the hierarchy, what remains after that? So there was a British political commentator who said about communism. So in communism, all people are equal, but some people are more equal than others. <laughs> what that means, although they said we'll have no classes, but how can you ensure that there are no classes? There has to be a government who will ensure that there is no class division. But then the government gets so much power. When the government gets power, then what happens is that uh, the go those who are in power, they become powerful. And eventually you end up creating classes. So there is a, uh, uh, so the demoniac can work in by saying that uh, we are on top, so we'll crush you. Or the demoniac can work by saying, those who are on top will destroy you. But then you destroy those who are on top, then what happens? Those who are not talented, those who are not competent, then if they are in power, they can't do much. So the, so the, the, the Varanashram, for example, is a hierarchy. But the hierarchy is maintained by encouraging virtue in those who are at the top. The Brahmanas and Kshatriyas are at the top and naturally they have some abilities. But if they have virtue, then they can move forward peacefully. So the we see this demoniac in the modern political discourse. You say there is right and there is left. Now right wing politics, left wing politics. So the right is where hierarchy they emphasize that you know this hierarchy is important. Now we have this border. No, there is nobody should come inside our border. The left is oh there should be no hierarchy. There should be equality. There should be no borders at all. Now both can go towards extreme. And extremism in either way can lead to demoniac ideas. Now, demoniac means destroy. Just destroy whatever is there. So one is those who are on top destroy those who are at the bottom. Or the other is you destroy the whole structure itself. Now it's very easy to destroy existing structures. But to create something else is not so easy. So it's often sometimes there are revolutionaries. The revolutionaries they blow up a bridge, blow up a government building. But then when they get power after that, then they are in power for five years, but still this build, bridge is not yet built. Because to, to build anything, to maintain anything is tough. So both ways there is demoniac nature that can come in the world. And when this demoniac nature comes, <clears throat> it, can, it can be very exploitative. Say for example, one way we see this uh, attitude of destroying one's opponents that is there in the world today that is with respect to this whole issue of abortion now Prabhupada would often say that uh, if a man and a woman unite inappropriately then it is the woman who becomes burdened with a child and then she has to take care so now so there is a hierarchy there are males and females so now the current idea is destroy this hierarchy so how do we destroy this hierarchy? Well, there is a difference. In the biological, the difference between male and female. So their argument is, there are some very, you could say, extremists on the left side. So they say that nature has been unfair to women by burdening them with pregnancy. 
so their argument is that pregnancy is biological slavery and abortion is technological liberation <laughs> so with this idea they militantly oppose anyone opposing abortion now this is this is yes that there is a particular hierarchy but like yesterday i was talking about how nobody has it very easy in the material world some people may say oh men abuse women it it can happen that there are men who can abuse their power but actually throughout history life itself has been so tough that men women together are trying to face the difficulty of life it is nobody has time to abuse and exploit others and like i said in the past when wars would happen there would be coal mine workers all these these would be men who would be working so hierarchies there is always a possibility that hierarchy can become abusive but if you destroy the hierarchy then nothing is left yeah uh, so when i was watching this documentary about welfare programs and how they work in different societies they found that these welfare programs uh, were not very successful in say uh, western economies but it was very successful in say society like japan so when people were given welfare in other societies they were generally used to take advantage of them and that was mm. in japan the culture was completely different people used to work for honor and their country That's and true. things like that Mm. So, is it? So, would you say that the reason why you know we need hierarchy and all of these things is primarily because we are also of that kind of a uh, human nature is uh, not that developed. Um, so, even within humans, we have different societies where in some programs work for some societies over others because they are more mature about it. Okay, it's a. it's a big subject i'll answer briefly maybe we can talk after the class also a little bit cuz i want to complete the we have to complete the 18 chapter but i'll mention quickly see as far as welfare programs are concerned anything material can be useful anything means if anything is well thought out it can be helpful and there is nothing wrong in per se providing support to people but the point is at what expense so the idea is there was a british thing there was this german thinker frederick nietzsche who said that god is dead famously so he said the death of god will lead now god never dies but the idea that people's faith in god has died so that can either lead to two things authoritarianism or nihilism nihilism is the complete destruction of hierarchy there's nothing life has no meaning life has no purpose rejection of all traditions and authoritarianism is where what happens is that basically people reject god and then they make the government into god that the government decides that who will get how much money the government decides how much who can earn the government will take care of everything so okay if somebody is old and sick the government will take care of them somebody need this help the government will take care of them now the government has its place but you, now the government is not a faceless entity government is also full of people and those people can also become corrupted so if there is there are people with as you said a sense of honor then with a sense of honor they can make any system work reasonably well but what happens in general if there is any kind of authoritarian system then if it is governed by a person who is honorable then it can work quite well but how long will that honorable person last after that some dishonorable person might come and grab power and then to dislodge them will be very difficult so there are traditional systems of dependence like in the in in america this is i studied america a little bit more so but might be similar in other countries also they had the african americans and they were economically rising till about 1960 70s 75 but then they did, america decided to launch a war on poverty and their idea of war on poverty was that they would provide governmental support not so that african americans would get jobs and get education get it but if somebody is like a if somebody is a single mother they would provide if somebody is not earning a particular amount of money they would provide support so by that what happened basically many men 
they started uniting with women and stopped taking up responsibility. So then basically similarly when if you are below a particular financial level then you take care then the government will take care of you. So people will not do jobs and stay below the income level basic income level and then get money from the government. So there is basic human nature which is which tends to be uh, go downward. And if there is that is facilitated so if the government support is in addition to the family bonds, that is good. But if the government support starts replacing the family bonds, then that leads to dis disruption of the structure of society. And that leads to a lot of problems in the long run. So I would say that good people are there, then hierarchy, uh, is it that can everybody, if there is no hierarchy at all, if people are sufficiently evolved, it can work without hierarchy. I doubt it very much because not everybody will be equally evolved. No matter how how much uh, education is there, facility is there. So there is, um, actually I'm doing a whole uh, three-day seminar in Mumbai this. You know, are people innately good or people innately bad? So now, today the idea is, the Christian idea is people are innately bad because we all, all committed sin, the original sin. The modern leftist idea is that people are innately good. But there are situations which make them bad. Now they are economically deprived, they are politically suppressed, they are racially discriminated against. Now the reality is a combination of both. Combination that the soul has an innate potential for virtue. But the mind has an innate propensity for vice. And we exist above this. So, the, so is there are people innately good if you want to say innate in terms of the soul yes we all have a potential for good because we are part of God but all of us are the soul is covered by the mind and most often in Kali Yuga, the mind has a propensity towards passion and ignorance so therefore the potential for good has to fight against the propensity for evil and then come out and that's not very easy so there might be some atheists who because of past life or whatever or this life upbringing they are relatively in goodness and they think that if everybody becomes atheists they will all become like us but it's not like that they might be in goodness but others will not be so we have to recognize that at one level <coughs> situations can make people bad but at another level we see that even if those situations the same bad situation will be there for two people but one person becomes a criminal and other person becomes a upstanding citizen so situations don't produce don't make people in a particular way situations can prompt people to become a particular way so we at one level work for social change so that everybody is provided the facility to grow in life but we don't think social change is omnipotent in today's world idea is that Social engineering will solve all problems. But that is, you could say, almost a demoniac idea. Because it thinks that through social engineering, we can play God. If people have lower tendencies, people are in Rajas and Tamas, then no matter how much social engineering you may do, they will use it or abuse it for their own purposes. So social engineering is required to facilitate people's potential for goodness. But at the same time, because the mind has a propensity for vice, that needs to be checked. And hierarchies are required for keeping that in check. Okay. So, let's move on to, where were we? I was talking about 14th, 15th verses. So now after this, Krishna talks about how we become entangled. And there's a very, can you go to the 18th verse? Tanaham hmm. Dushita. No, sorry, 19th verse. Yeah. Ta let's recite this. Tanaham Dushita Kruran Samsare Shunaradhaman Shweva Yonishu. So Krishna is saying that I cast those who are sinful, those who are demoniac, into demoniac species. What does he mean by that? If they are demoniac, what is the point of casting them into demoniac species? That means it's not that Krishna is like a god who 
cast people into hell deliberately. He's saying, this is your nature, then this is the situation you are best situated in. So he's simply reciprocating with our actions. So basically the whole world's purpose is to give us opportunity to act according to our desires. So it's sometimes asked that, that in this world, the good paths, the good choices are so few and the bad choices are so many. So why is it like that? Now that's how it always is in any multiple choice exam. <laughs> <laughs> One right choice, four wrong choices. But it's not probability or chance by which you have to make the right choice. It's education. So because most souls have these lower desires, that's why Krishna allows them to go in the lower directions. And then Krishna talks about later the three gates to hell. Which are those three gates? Does anyone know? Lust, anger and greed. Now it's interesting when Krishna talks about these three, he says that they are, they are the gates to hell. Trividham, Narkas, Sedam, Dwaram, Nasha, Namatmana. Dwara is a door. Nasha is destruction. So they are the doors to the destruction of the soul. Now the soul by its very nature is indestructible. So how can there be destruction of the soul? So Krishna is using this in a metaphorical sense. Not in literal sense that the soul will be destroyed, but rather the soul's spiritual inclination, the soul's capacity for spiritual self-understanding, that's what will be destroyed. And then after that, he talks about how, therefore, now somebody might say, but then, okay, I'm born with a demoniac nature. And then what do I do? Krishna says, follow Shastra. That's the last verse of this chapter. Tasmat, let's decide this, 1624. Tasmat Shastram Pramanam Te Karya Karya Vyavasthitav Gyatva Shastra Vidhanoktam Karma Kartam Iharhasi So, scripture does not deny that we have our particular nature, but scripture says that channel your nature according to Shastra. And that's why Shastra is not uniform. Shastra is multiform. Uniform means everybody has to follow one set of rules. But that's not going to work. Because different people are at different levels. That's why, you know, for Brahmanas, there are certain rules of purity. For Kshatriyas, there are different rules. For Vaishyas, there are different rules. For Shudras, there are different rules. Now, the word Shudra can be used to talk about low class people. But it's not so much a matter of low class as it's a matter of human types. There are different types of people. There are people with different mindsets, different attitudes. So in a sense, scripture gives different rules for different people. But we need to follow the rules according to our level. And when you follow in this way, then we can get elevated. So not everybody can live according to Brahmanical standards of purity. But that doesn't mean that they should live completely impure lives. That they can follow the rules according to whatever level they are at and gradually they will rise upwards so shastra is according shastra basically its purpose is that we have ungodly side we have godly side within us so that the godly side is gradually developed and the ungodly side is kept in check so that it doesn't take us too much off track and that way one acts one moves on but if one starts justifying one's ungodly side, Duryodhan, when he was advised that please return the Pandavas kingdom to them, he was absolutely not ready to do that. And one justification he gave over there is, he said, oh, why are all of you blaming me? He says, the creator has given everyone their nature and all living beings act according to their nature. So this is my nature and I'm acting according to my nature. Now, here there is a misuse of the word nature. Nature means he is a Kshatriya, he, he cannot be told to become a Brahmana. But nobody can say it's my nature to steal from others and I'll keep stealing. <laughs> nature refers there to the kind, of the kind of occupation that one does, the kind of profession one chooses. Brahmana, Kshatriya, Shudras, they have particular professions. But if somebody says my nature is to be lusty, my nature is to be greedy, my nature is to be... Uh, Okay, if somebody has greed, there is a dharmic way that you use the, the craving for more to work hard and earn. But if there is somebody uses that greed to rob others, to swindle others, then that's unethical. 
so greed itself is not the, uh, so you could say that the desire for more itself is not necessarily intrinsically the problem but when that desire for more goes beyond ethical limits so the difference between ambition and greed is that am when ambition crosses the limits of ethics then it becomes greed when we go beyond when our ambition makes us go beyond ethical boundaries then it becomes greed so scripture gives us certain boundaries those boundaries are not meant to suppress us but the the boundaries are meant to make sure that we don't cross we don't give unrestricted we don't given unrestrictedly to our demoniac nature so everybody who follows this, their their particular nature according to shastra they'll gradually get elevated that's the essential conclusion of this chapter any questions about this okay one question yeah Yes. Similar. Yes. Okay. There are many lists given. Are there any differences? Not necessarily. There are different contexts. Say, for example, now if you want to say that if somebody wants to be a, become a preacher, they need to have these qualities. If somebody wants to become a counselor, they need to have these qualities. if somebody wants to become a manager they have to have these qualities now we could say there might be 80% overlap in all the three qualities but there may be some differences the managers may need to have certain skills say if somebody wants to be a preacher they need to be at least fluent in expressing themselves now that might not be required if somebody they need not be a public good public speaker if they want to be managers or they want to be mentors counselors so that can vary so overall there is not much difference but based on the thrust we can spot specific differences okay how do we understand the extinction of various species existence extinction extinction okay quickly an answer how do species become extinct see the body is like a dress it's like clothes and we could say material nature is like a global clothes manufacturing company um, so now say if it's summer you go to the shops also you might not get any warm clothes over there why it's not because that company doesn't stop producing my, my warm clothes because that's not that's not what is suited to the atmosphere over there so like that the body is like a, a clothing for the soul and if the particular uh, environment changes then particular clothes may no longer be viable for that soul so then those that clothing is no longer manufactured by material nature so that's so if we say dinosaurs have become extinct all that it means is they that particular body for a particular soul is no longer available because it no longer manifest because uh, that body is ultimately the soul is given a particular body so that it can exist and fulfill its desires in the particular atmosphere it is in but if that body itself cannot survive well then what is the point of providing that body so what it means is that simply material nature has stopped manufacturing that particular body for that partic- for some time because the atmosphere may change so when we say 8.4 million species exist that does not necessarily mean those 8.4 million species have to exist at every place in the universe at all times there are always upheavals and when upheavals are there certain species may become extinct certain species may be manifest more that can happen okay so let's go to the 17th chapter now <clears throat> the 17th chapter is again a further study of material nature uh, in terms of three modes so <clears throat> the first 8 verses 1 to 8 they talk about shraddha and guna the interaction of modes and faith and then i think from 9 to 24 we look at the numbers as we move forward 924 krishna talks about 
यज्ञ दान तप एंड अन्न इन द थ्री मोड्स यज्ञ दान तप एंड अन्न अन्न इज फूड इन द थ्री मोड्स एंड देन ट्वेंटी फाइव ऑनवर्ड्स इज यज्ञ दान तप एंड अन्न अन्न इज फूड and then 25 what is om tat sat as means of spiritualizing everything so so now om tat sat as a means of spiritualizing everything so if we look at the 16th chapter 16th chapter talk about the divine and demoniac natures so that means krishna is talked about the tree which those who are at the top of the tree those are at the bottom of the tree the godly and the ungodly but arjuna has a question that what about those who are in between his first question is his question in the 17th chapter he starts is that let's recite this yah shastra vidhi mutsrujya vartate shraddhayan vitaha tesham nishtha tu a krishna सर्वस्य श्रद्धा भवति भारत श्रद्धा मयोयम पुरुषो यो यश्रद्ध स एव सह सो नाउ हियर श्रद्धा मयो कृष्ण से टू थिंग्स ओवर हियर दैट सत्वानूपा सर्व श्रद्धा भवति भारत so according to our existence our faith is shaped that means some people they just come to a temple and they have such innate faith just come to a temple and they are yeah, god exists they don't need any or reasoning or proving for that purpose and some people uh, no matter how much you reason and argue they just don't accept this and you know all of us have faith in something like some people have a lot of faith there's no problem that money can't solve and they they will they be almost like pure devotees of money he said it you know money at all costs so now yes the money is powerful but other people if if somebody if some people if you say that money can't produce happiness some people say okay but right now it will produce happiness for me so some people say, but i want money right some people say no 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 money yeah, i understand it can't produce happiness some people are saying you know only people who have enough money say like this so different people can have different attitudes now some people will say i need money right now but i understand it money is not the ultimate purpose of life so the point i am making is that everybody has certain faith in certain things satvan roopa sarvasya one of the most famous patriots in america i forget his name he said i have only one regret in my life and that regret is i have only one lifetime of serf- serving america <laughs> <laughs> now you could say he has so much uh, love for his country so he has faith in the greatness of america so how does so different people have different kinds of faith so according to our existence our faith is shaped and then shraddha mayo yam purusho essentially we are nothing but our faith we are made of our faith so shraddha maya maya means filled with or made of anand maya like we say shraddha maya shraddha mayo yam purusho we are made of our faith so bhakti is not just about say chanting hari krishna or coming to a temple it is basically about changing what we have faith in. we may have faith in our intelligence we may have faith in our wealth we may have faith in our country we may have faith in our connections 
we may have faith in our abilities and all this is good we need these are things which we require in our lives it's not bad but if these become the our ultimate faith then it can it will be a problem sooner or later so bhakti is about shifting the foundation of our ultimate faith from all these things to krishna so so according to our modes we will have faith in something or the other <clears throat> some people have great faith in alcohol there is no problem so big that its solution is not found at the bottom of the bottle of alcohol is drink and forget your problems so now they have faith in that so we all have faith in something so now yo ye shraddha sa eva sah and as is one's faith so will one become so krishna is talking about three things according to our existence our faith is shaped and we are nothing but our faith and as our faith is so our existence will be in future so he's talking about the centrality of faith in our actions and then he says that if we want to know what is the level of people who are not explicitly following shastra then look at how they live look at what modes they are situated in if you understand the mode that they are situated in then we will be able to understand their level so <clears throat> the bhagavad gita does not earlier bhagavad gita talked about that there are divine and demoniac but as i made very clear krishna doesn't use the word bhakti in association with the divine because even people who might be demoniac they might take a bhakti and people who might be divine they might be proud of their piety and they may not take a bhakti so divine and demoniac we can say there is a correlation between them and bhakti but it's not causation it's not that demoniac will be necessarily away from bhakti and divine will be naturally devotees so our philosophy doesn't say that anybody who doesn't follow our path they are all going to go to hell to say that, okay if you're not following this path then uh, what are the qualities according to which you are living and those qualities will determine where one will go and how do we know what are the qualities of a person that we know by their actions and then krishna talks about, so this whole chapter is basically try to understand where a person is going by how they are living so then he talks first about anna so this is this all this goes on till sixth verse but then let us see yeah so so actually this starts from 7 uh, no is yeah, the seventh one what, what did i say 8 to 9th 1 to 8 no it's, so, so it's 1 to 6 sorry and from 7th on what is going on so krishna talks about आहारस्वी सर्व त्रिविधाती प्रिया एंड देर थ्री काइंड ऑफ फूड ए सम पीपल लाइक फूड विच इज नॉट वेरी नॉट वेरी स्पाइसी नॉट वेरी ऑयली सम पीपल इफ यू गिव दैम फूड ऑल्सो दे विल से प्लीज गिव मी सम मिर्ची प्लीज गिव मी सम स्पाइस एंड देन टेक दैट एंड दे ईड दैट एंड देन दे फील लाइक इट्स फन ना नॉट से इट्स गुड और बैड <laughs> it's just that we all have particular choices in our diet so krishna is saying that there is certain kind of food which will which will be dear for certain kinds of people so by the kind of food people are eating we can understand what that is one indicator of their their of their level of consciousness so if somebody doesn't even think about say killing animals and eating them and that is uh, i mean like their consciousness is very low any kind of animal slaughter is very bad and uh, killing us but you know among various animals i think there are crabs crabs are actually they are cooked alive you know people catch the crabs and then directly put them in the hot hot vessel so it's it's horrible so oh, now there you can actually see them suffering but still people cook and eat so that means the consciousness has become so diminished uh, there's an indian saint tukaram maharaj he says that uh, when a slaughterer kills an animal the slaughterer if they hold the animal they are care the slaughterer is careful that their finger doesn't get the slightest cut but they are ready to cut off the neck of the animal that means they are so conscious of not causing the slightest pain to themselves but they're causing enormous pain to others they don't per- perceive that also so basically what we eat indicates uh, in one way what is the level of our consciousness 
Yeah. Uh, but research has also shown that uh, you know plants have a nervous system, and they actually when you pluck out the leaves, they actually yeah, of course, there's no doubt about that. And yeah, they actually respond to anesthesia, so which means that they actually have a no doubt about it. Yeah, no doubt. But there is, we can say three things over there. First is that plants definitely have nervous system, and this is how our <clears throat> philosophy that you know that all living beings have souls, even plants have souls. That's what has been indicated by it. Mm -hmm. But we can also say that the principle of karma is that we cause as less pain as possible to others. That so for jivo jivasya jivanam, that is the principle of material existence. That one life form is the food for another life form. So we cannot avoid that principle. That's why we cause minimum pain, as minimum pain as possible. So, because the nervous system of the uh, plants is far, far less developed than that of animals. Although they experience pain, the pain that they experience is far lesser. From the spiritual perspective, the soul's consciousness is developed far less in a plant body than in an animal body. And in an animal body, it is far less developed than the human body. So, for example, in the human body, Say, if somebody whom we trust or love, they betray us. That betrayal, that causes great pain. Now in animal body, there is, there is no such thing as marriage, there is no such thing as, that kind of pain is not there. So, because the consciousness in human body is more developed, so we can experience deeper pleasure, but you can also experience greater pain. In the animal body, it's lesser, in the plant body, it is even lesser. So, because the plant body, the pain is lesser, so that's why that is considered far less sinful. Second point is that quite often, whenever we, whenever we take the products of the vegetarian world for our food, it is more or less they have already attained the end of their lifespan. Fruits more or less fall off from the tree. If we don't pluck them, they will fall off and then they will rot on their own. Crops, they are more or less harvested. Uh, uh, more, when they are harvested, they are more or less grown. If we don't cut them at that time, they will just uh, decay and die. But usually when animals are slaughtered, they are not slaughtered at the end of their lives. They are slaughtered at the prime of their lives. So with respect to fruits and crops, it's more or less that their life is ending. But animals, it's not like that. And thirdly, we, we could say that beyond what beyond logic or beyond this kind of reasoning intrinsically we understand there is a difference say if tomorrow your children come and say that uh, oh our teacher has said that we are going for a field trip we are going for a picnic where oh we are going to a farm to see harvesting festival so you say okay nice it's a good thing to go and see but if the teacher come and says oh if that's to your children say tomorrow our teacher is going to take us to a slaughterhouse to see a slaughter festival. Slaughter festival. <laughs> <laughs> can't even use that word. Slaughter festival, isn't it? <laughs> so we intrinsically understand also there is a difference between the two. And of course, ultimately we say that even vegetarian food is not enough. Vegetarian food should be offered to Krishna. So that's when it's completely karma free. But relatively speaking, the karma is much lesser. So then, basically, then Krishna talks about yajna, dana, and tapa. Now, these three can be understood uh, in a narrow sense as well as in a broad sense. What do I mean by what is the concept of yajna, dana, tapa? <coughs> the remaining sections, Krishna will talk about these three things as a means by which we can know what is the level of consciousness of a person. So. Yajna, see basically the soul exists within three cosmic circles. The circle of the body, the circle of society and the circle of nature. And in whichever circle we exist, we need to live in harmony with it. So that means that if we live in a body, 
वाइल लिविंग द बॉडी द वे वी हारमोनाइज और द वे वी सेक्रीफाइस इज बाय डूइंग तप सो द बॉडी इंस्टेड ऑफ इंडल्जिंग इनडिस्क्रिमेटली वी हैव सम काइंड ऑफ रेगुलेशन दैट्स तप देन दैट इज द वे वी हारमोनाइज विथ आर बॉडी इन सर्कल देन फॉर सोसाइटी इन विच वी आर लिविंग वी डू दान दैट्स चैरिटी वी गिव सम समथिंग इन कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन and then with nature or with the higher reality that is yagya yag the whole idea here is that what is the level of consciousness of a person if a person is simply in gross sensual con- sensory consciousness then that person will think that okay this body is simply for my pleasure this society is simply for my enjoyment but in every society you know, if we take something from society we are also meant to give something to society mm. Mm. because that's how reciprocation is so if a person is aware that yagya dana tapad these basically indicate the levels of consciousness of a person so a person who is in tamas they think that okay what do why do i have to give dana i don't have to give any charity at all i'll just take whatever i want from society and if at all i have to give something now they give also for destructive causes what do you mean for destructive causes it's like uh, suppose somebody has gone to a bar for drinking and they drunk from a bottle and they maybe last uh, maybe last 1/10th of the bottle is remaining and outside the bar there's a beggar lying over there and the beggar looks at them and they give that bottle to be kya yaad rakhega le le take this bottle now okay you could say it's charity <laughs> but what is that charity that charity is actually going to degrade the consciousness of the person to whom you are giving the charity so we may give charity but for what do you give charity that also determines our level of consciousness so basically the idea is by looking at these activities how does a person take care of their body or not take care of their body now we can get obsessed with taking care of our body and make that the primary business of our life or we can just neglect our body and just think i'll enjoy my senses no matter what what whether it is healthy or unhealthy for the body so by looking at how we live we can how somebody is living overall means how much is their consciousness related with their bodily circle with their social circle with their environmental circle so for example now we see that there is a lot of environmental consciousness which is rising now to some extent there is in any area there can always be uh, alarmist propaganda and there can be extreme propaganda some people say that the ocean is going to rise so much that all the coastal cities are going to go under water now there are some some scientists who said that some scientists who oppose that and more or less so that's why earlier the word was was global warming but now the evidence for global warming has been so much challenged that now they change the word and they call it climate change so climate now there is definitely some concern for how we human beings are exploiting and disrupting the planet and that awareness of that is indicating some level of rise of consciousness so <clears throat> in today's world there are broadly four areas in which we can see a slight rise of consciousness towards sattva one is the environmental consciousness environmentalism you could say veganism the yoga and mindfulness so all these so everybody needs to take care of their health but instead of just putting chemicals into the body and trying to take care of health people do yoga that is better than just pumping chemicals so they are doing some discipline sitting in some kind of postures doing some kind of regulation there is also one way they are doing some austerity so people give charity and giving charity it's it's a good thing if somebody gives charity of course if they give charity for the highest cause that is the best but if they giving charity that is good so in one sense if you talk about welfare programs they are good because at least there is concern for those who are not doing those who are uh, less well off than us but another problem with uh, uh, with welfare programs is often that it when it doesn't increase the compassion within one's heart because when the government takes taxes from you 
we don't feel that oh I, what happens is because we are not connecting with the people who are benefiting from it mm. so it just it doesn't really increase the compassion within our hearts so but the point is some people might um, themselves be giving for some good cause and then if they understand how krishna consciousness is the highest cause then they can move forward much better so by looking at the level at which people are acting then we can understand that there is uh, what the level of consciousness of the person is so what kind of yagya they are doing what kind of daan they are giving and what kind of tapa they are doing so yagya means some people like i said about environmental consciousness some people just think that the whole world is there for our taking just exploit and use and don't bother anything about nature at all people think no we have to consider the future generations also mm. we have to live in such a way that our future generation should also be able to live so that's a slightly broadened consciousness so by looking at the consciousness of people we can see that even today's world there are a lot of thoughtful people who are concerned about the future they may not be directly devotees in a, in the sense that we define as devotees but if they are thinking about the long term they are thinking about the bigger picture that indicate that the consciousness is evolved so it means how do they in, broadly speaking i'll summarize this part is that how does one see one's relationship with one's own body and mind how does one see one's relationship with society and how does one see one's relationship with nature that vision will determine the level of one's consciousness and accordingly one will get elevated or degraded so if somebody is thinking about environmental consciousness then they are thinking at least in some terms about having a healthy relationship with nature if somebody is doing yoga or mindfulness then they are thinking about taking care of their body in a way that involves them taking up some responsibility not just outsourcing the responsibility to take some pills to do whatever they want and take some pills and everything will be all right there is some amount of regulation there similarly if somebody is giving some charity they feel some sense of obligation to others and that is good so this way we can understand yagya dana tapa in today's context <clears throat> and the last part of this chapter is where krishna talks about the <clears throat> om tat sat So actually, this starts from hmm, actually starts from. Let me see, twenty-three rather. Sorry, oh, twenty-three. It starts off. Om. Yeah, let's recite this verse. Om Tat Sat Iti Nirdesho Brahmana Strivida Smrtaha Brahmana Ste Na Vedasya Yagyaasya Vihita Pura. So here, what Krishna is doing is. he is talking om tat sat these three words are there and often uh, in the broad hindu tradition we talk about these three words as means for spiritualizing an activity any activity so prabhupad also at the end of the introduction of the shrimad bhagavatam he says om tat sat so the idea is om om indicates now now this is a whole subject and this is because it's technical i cannot go into all of it because it requires a lot of understanding of the vedic context understand but but simply i put what is this om is a way of invocation like we say om namo narayanaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya om is a means of invocation then tad refers to that and sat is real or eternal so om tat sat what it means is i invoke that which is eternal that is the simple meaning of this word so om tat sat is om is invocation tat tat is refers to that reality and sat is that which lasts forever or that which is eternal om tat sat is a way of invoking the eternal i invoke the eternal that means whatever i am doing we can do it for immediate or short term purposes or we can do it for eternal purpose what does that mean that means that if somebody has some god given ability somebody can sing well somebody can write well somebody can speak well somebody can decorate well now we might directly do that as a service to krishna wherever we can and that's good but if there are times when we can't do it as a service to krishna it's for our profession or it's as a hobby or whatever but then if we think of it that these are abilities which have been given to me by god and let me use these abilities for service 
for spiritualizing for eternalize for for invoking the eternal for attaining the eternal or for contributing to the eternal so then in a mood of service then that itself will give some eternal result so narayana eti samarpayami as i said in the famous prayer that whatever i am doing let me offer this to lord narayana now people may not have the idea of specifically narayana but almost across the world those people who have been involved in any creative endeavor artists or painters or writers now they recognize that there is something beyond this world which we are invoking that there is a, that there is inspiration which enables people to do wonderful things and sometimes the inspiration comes sometimes the inspiration doesn't come and for that inspiration to come there is Uh, we become a channel for something higher and when that inspiration doesn't come we do our best but we understand that when the inspiration comes i'll be able to do something extraordinary when it doesn't come i'll just do the best that i can in my situation so if we think of our abilities as our abilities and if we could think of the results of that as our possessions then that is narrow mind that is short sightedness but when we say oh when om tat sat is said the idea is that i am doing this to connect with whatever is the bigger reality so there is a something higher than me so newton would say whenever he would make some scientific discovery he would say that oh father i think thy thoughts after thee that means he saw his scientific discoveries as spiritual insights into the way that god has created this world what are the principles by which god has created this trying to understand that so if we have that vision so we might be doing our job and the job might be it might be competitive it might be um, very materialistic atmosphere but if our mood is is i am in this position and i am doing this as a service i am going to use whatever god given talents i have and i work then we will be spiritualizing our consciousness that way okay so that is about om tat sat now <clears throat> let's go to the 18th chapter and now the 18th chapter is the longest chapter in the bhagavad gita it has 78 verses as now the second longest the second chapter which has 72 verses so now in these 78 verses three things broadly are happening first is krishna is summarizing what he has said or we could say repeating or reiterating the essential message that he has given earlier but krishna is also integrating the concept of the three modes which he has talked about earlier in this chapter uh, in the previous chapters and finally he gives a concluding call of action so let's go back the 18th chapter is uh, let's focus on it section by section so the first text 1 to 12 it talks about the concept of renunciation in the three modes so renunciation in the three modes means what that okay, i think you can then from 13 to 20 sorry third not 13 to 40 it talks about analyzing action within the three modes analyzing action within three modes then from 41 to 55 from karma yoga through gyan yoga to bhakti yoga from karma yoga through gyan yoga to bhakti yoga from 56 to 66 is a direct practice of bhakti yoga
then 67 to 78 is Falashruti and then Arjuna's understanding and Sanjay's understanding, three parts to it. Krishna gives the Falashruti, then Arjuna gives his understanding and then Krishna gives his understanding. Sorry, not Krishna, Sanjay gives his understanding. Falashruti is the fruit of hearing. Thank you. So it's uh, 1 to 12, 13 to 40, 41 to 45 and 56 to 66, isn't it? And 67, 56 to 66 and 67 to 78 then. So let's go over this. We'll try to go as fast as we can. Now, Arjuna's dilemma at the start of the Gita was, should I fight or should I not fight? And he was thinking in terms of two options. If I fight, I will get entangled because I'll be doing bad karma. I'll be fighting against my relatives. But if I don't fight, then what will happen? Uh, I will be giving up my dharma. So what should I do? So that is the same question with which Arjuna begins again. Please tell me what is Tyaga and what is Sanyasa. So Sanyasa broadly refers to the ashram of Sanyasa. Tyaga, <coughs> Tyaga refers to the mood of renunciation. So Krishna says that essentially while analyzing this, Krishna also brings the three modes over here. And he says there can be renunciation in the mode of ignorance, in the mode of passion and in the mode of goodness. Renunciation in the mode of ignorance is ignorance and passion that is undesirable. Why? Because that renunciation is driven primarily by the desire to avoid trouble. So if somebody says that, hey, you know, this is such hard work. I don't want to do hard work. So then, then that is okay. We should not, we don't have to work unnecessarily hard. But spirituality is not about avoiding hard work. It is about having productive hard work. Practicing bhakti also requires hard work. So, I think I'm, uh, maybe I mentioned this last time and I had come that uh, this is an example of say renunciation in the lower modes. There's one boy who came to, when I was in Pune, he came once to me and he said that, he's not very regularly coming to the temple also. So he said that, you know, what is the process for becoming a brahmachari here? So, you know, he, this is, you want to become a brahmachari? He says, yes, I'm thinking about it. By Sunday evening, I'll decide. <laughs> this was Friday. I asked him, what's going to happen by Sunday? I said. So he says, I have proposed to a girl and she is going to reply by Sunday. So if she says no, I'll become a brahmachari. <laughs> so now, frustration is no qualification for renunciation. <laughs> <laughs> now frustration may start stimulating okay because the frustration one might start exploring spirituality but on the spiritual path also one may experience frustration so so if somebody just feels that oh there's too much trouble over here or there's there's not much pleasure here that's why i want to go there but then if you get trouble over there what are you going to do so so renunciation which is seen as a simply as an escape way from life's responsibilities or life's challenges that kind of renunciation is not very sustainable. Renunciation for us is meant primarily to not to avoid the world's problems, but to increase our absorption in the Lord. The purpose, renunciation is for what purpose? Krishna says, Naiva Tyaga Falam Labhet. I think he says in 18, where, where? Because it was 18, 5, I think. Naiva Tyaga Falam Labhet, is it? The next one, next one, five only, five only. Yadanta Pak Karma, six, seven, it's going on. Yadu Sanyasa, Karma no Padditha, eighth. Just to get a little confused. Yeah, Naiva Tyaga Falam Labhet. That if somebody renounces without a proper understanding of the purpose, then you may renounce, it's a Kaya Klesha Bhayat Tejet. Oh, this is very troublesome for me, so I'll give it up. But no, if it's troublesome, that alone is not the solution. So, now after this Krishna says, okay, then how should you work? 
says work with detachment so there is there is action and there is renunciation these are the two options which arjuna had should i follow action should i give up adopt renunciation so instead of action instead of rena- action or renunciation krishna gives him an integrated vision that is you can have renunciation in action that means you act but act with the mood of renunciation how can we act with the mood of renunciation it is if we have a higher purpose say for example some students are studying for an exam now there is a immediate result immediate result that is that they want marks but if somebody wants to do phd in that subject and somebody wants to do research in that subject then the primary concern is not just getting marks because if they don't understand that subject properly and that's the subject which they're going to study throughout their life then they will not be able to do well so we could say while working while studying one object is to get the marks but another object is to understand the subject so if you understand the subject then you can have a, you can go deeper into that subject so similar so so similarly when krishna says you when we work we can work to get the immediate results okay i want a salary i want position i want power but another purpose for working the big picture the big purpose is we work for attaining knowledge we work we work for getting purification we work for understanding the nature of reality we work ultimately for serving krishna so detach work work with renunciation means that don't be so obsessed with the immediate results of the work understand this work is for something bigger so when we say we are preaching at one level we want results we want that people should come for the programs people should grow but that's not the only purpose ultimately the purpose is that we connect with krishna that we go toward krishna that ultimately we attain krishna so that way if we have this bigger picture then renunciation will come more easily and then let's look at 18 12 now अनिष्टमिष्टमिष्टमचा mixture of results some good some bad anishtam ishtam mishram cha and those who do karma they will get these three kinds of fruits but one is a sanyasi now what does he mean by sanyasi not one who does no action but one who acts with a mood of sacrifice with a mood of detachment they will not get any of these materially entangling results good bad or in between they will transcend and that's the way in which we should function So now, after explaining this, Krishna goes into an another kind of analysis. You remember, I said the six, last six, six chapters are about how we can work in the world, or how to understand sang- from jnana to bhakti, from analyzing the world to transcending the world. So Arjuna's question is: If I'm going to act, what action lead to entanglement? That's a normal understanding. So then, what Krishna will do is he will analyze the components of action over here. and then we'll talk about how we can uh, we can transcend with those with that understanding so first he talks about what are the various factors in action that's 14th verse let's decide this adhishthanam tatha karta adhishthanam tatha karta karanam cha prathak vidham karanam cha prathak vidham विविधाश्च पृथक् चेष्टा विविधाश्च पृथक् चेष्टा दैवम चैवात्र पञ्चमम दैवम चैवात्र पञ्चमम सो कृष्ण इज सेटिंग द फाइव फैक्टर्स ऑफ एक्शन ओवर हियर व्हाट आर दे अधिष्ठानम तथा कर्ता सो लेट्स वी कैन अंडरस्टैंड दिस इन डिफरेंट वेज दिस वन इंटरेस्टिंग वे ऑफ लुकिंग एट दिस इज सपोज नाउ द क्रिकेट वर्ल्ड कप इज गोइंग ऑन नॉट सपोज इट्स गोइंग ऑन बट इन अ क्रिकेट मैच the performance what all does it depend on that the how well the players are playing the players playing is one factor but that's not the only factor mm-hmm. along with that you have to see how the pitch is mm-hmm. how the weather is no we could also say that the players are there but sometimes the players are in form sometimes the players are not in form the best player they are not in form then they kind of can't function so 
now somebody might take only one factor oh the pitch was bad that's why our team lost okay the pitch was bad but that's not the only factor <laughs> mm. but somebody may say oh you had such good players why did your team lose no even the best players if the pitch turns for one time then when somebody is batting the pitch is very good and then after the rains come and the pitch becomes very bad then best players might not be able to do so well so whenever we act there are many factors which come into the picture and recognizing these factors is important so if you consider the cricket metaphor we can say karta is the player so the soul is there the soul interacts with the subtle body the soul interacts with the gross body and the soul interacts with the physical world so for the souls actions to have results in the physical world what all is required that the what is the situation in the physical world that is important what is the situation in the mental world that is important and what is the soul the soul situation is also important so <clears throat> the karta is the soul hmm? then karanam karanam is the senses the senses are our means by which we interact with the physical world say like now if i am going to give a class right now over here say now if there were no loudspeaker over here now there are some people uh, their throat has a natural amplifier isn't it <laughs> even their normal speech is very loud uh, and some people even their loud speech is not very loud isn't it you tell them speak loud speak loudly so now if somebody has there is no sound system available and there is a big ground to be addressed a large number of people to address then the karanam karanam is the sensory instrument that is going to matter so try to understand in this way say the soul is here the subtle body is here the gross body is here the world is here when the soul has to act in the world for the result to manifest in the world this whole interaction has to work out properly so the karta is the soul karanam is the instrument by which the soul acts on the the you could say karanam is the instrument by which the soul acts on the physical world hmm? then the physical world is the adhisthanam so if you consider uh, we are going to a public talk we are giving so now then either the person has to have a loud voice or there has to be sound system that is the karanam but beyond that what all, what all are needed if you are going to give a public talk to understand the five factors of action that the if the audience itself is if the ground is very noisy say if it's like a that's if it's like a marketplace and not a western supermarket but indian marketplace <laughs> <laughs> where everybody is shouting out their wares no what is it 3 rupees kilo 3 rupees kilo something like that you know, people are shouting it out so then there if, if that is the venue where we are going to speak it's going to be very difficult to catch people's attention so adhisthanam refers to the venue it is the gross arena where we are acting the karanam is the instrument by which we are acting on that gross arena then <clears throat> if we consider cheshta cheshta is the endeavor cheshta is the way the depending on the kind of moods that are influencing us our moods are determined and when the mood is good when you know, things are clicking even in professional circles people talk about something called a flow and when you are in flow then you can perform wonderfully but when you are not in flow you just can't perform so well so that is the cheshta so cheshta is we could say our own motivation our own mood our own flow we our flow our instrument that we have for acting the place where we are acting and ultimately daiva daiva is destiny so all these five have to work out together so it could be that the ground is very good the batsman is in form but then it rains at that time then you won't get any results so krishna talks about how if we understand these various factors of action then we can act properly now i cannot go into these factors very much but this the point of going into these factors is to understand how krishna is uh, explaining the various components of action so without going into technicalities krishna talks about after this six things 
So that those six things are based on the verse, I think it's 18, yeah. Jnanam genyam parijnata trividha karma chodana karanam karma karteti trividha karma sangraha. And then based on the Krishna analysis, Jnanam karma cha karta cha daiva guna bhedata. That's text 19. So Jnana, karma and karta. So after this, from text 20 onwards, Krishna will talk about Jnana in the three modes, then he'll talk about karma in the three modes, then he'll talk about karta in the three modes. So that is still from text 20 onwards till text 29. Then text 30 onwards, he talks about then buddhi in the three modes, then dhruti in the three modes, and sukha in the three modes. So basically, he's analyzing various things in the three modes. Say, so when we, when we have to do some activity, we have to have some knowledge with which you do the activity. Then we have some, inter, so we have to have basic driving knowledge, say, if you want to drive a car. But then, the Krishna uses the word jnana and buddhi. They're two different things. We could say jnana is with respect to how we take in information from the outer world. Buddhi is with respect to how we act in the outer world. So we have Jnana Indriyas and we have Karma Indriyas. So Jnana refers to how we take in information from the outer world. And that's with respect to how we handle the Jnana Indriyas. And Buddhi refers to how we handle the Karma Indriyas. How we act in the world. And then, then, then we have Buddhi Dhruti. Dhruti is determination. And while acting in the world, we need to push on with determination. So there can be three kinds of determination. Determination goodness, determination passion, determination ignorance. So what is determination and ignorance? That means that you know, some if somebody says I have no determination, if somebody says alcoholic or somebody is very lazy, I have no determination. What it, if somebody says oh I have no determination to wake up in the morning? That means you have determination to keep sleeping in the morning. <laughs> everybody else is say woken up, but still still sleeping on. So everybody has determination, but based on the modes, it is misdirected. We could say at one level, addiction is also determination. Isn't it? That the person loses their health. If a person is alcoholic, they lose their health. They lose their money. They they make a fool of themselves sometimes while driving under alcohol. Of, while Talk, talking under alcoholic influence while driving they may get into legal trouble but in spite of all this they keep drinking there's determination there's determination in three modes and then there is happiness happiness in the three modes and the idea of talking about happiness is that and we understand that there are different kinds of pleasures there's some kind of pleasure simply say watching movies all day but then another kind of pleasure in doing some tangible work in the world and achieving something constructive by that so like that, there are different modes, and based on understanding those modes, uh, we can analyze actions. And with this analysis, then Krishna says that there is Varanashram. Varanashram means that there is Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, and all of them have their duties. And if all of them work according to their karma, then they all can be elevated. So can you go to 1846? 46, 47, 48. Let's decide 46 one. Yataha pravritir bhutanam. Yena sarvam idam tatam. Yena sarvam idam tatam. Svakarmanatam abhircha. Svakarmanatam abhircha. Siddhim vindatimanava. Siddhim vindatimanava. So Siddhim vindatimanava. Okay, that says you attain perfection. How will you attain perfection? By worshipping. By Swakarmana Tamabhyarcha, by your work, worship him. Now, this is often translated as Karma hi Puja hai. Now, work is worship, is, is good as an ethical principle or as a moral principle that, that no work should be looked down upon, everybody should be respected, whatever work they are doing. But it is not a spiritual principle. If work is worship, then what will happen? The donkey will become the greatest worshipper. <laughs> Now work itself is not worship. Work, Krishna is not saying work is worship. Krishna is saying work in a mood of worship. Swakarmana tamabhyarcha. By your work, worship the Lord. So if we understand that, yata, that actually my abilities have come from some higher source. And let me use those abilities in a mood of service. In a mood of uh, contribution. Then we can actually grow in our life. This is the way we can, even if somebody is doing some work, they can spiritualize their work. 
a brahmana will actually be intellectual but if they are intellectual for the purpose of uh, understanding and sharing life's deeper truths then they are growing by that then krishna after this talks about so this is karma yoga but it is karma yoga directed with higher consciousness then krishna talks about gyan yoga from 49th verse onwards and 54 55 he talks about bhakti and then when he talks about bhakti the idea is that by practicing bhakti one can attain life's perfection then from 56th verse he talks about so this is a gradual way it's like say if we want to there's a big skyscraper building and from one side there is a staircase and you take one step one step one step one step and a long flight of stairs we take up over there and finally we reach to the top so this is krishna describing the gradual incremental way of rising from 41 to 45 is from karma yoga through gyan yoga to bhakti yoga but then if somebody goes around the building and they find there's a elevator just get into the elevator straight you will go up so that krishna says is bhakti yoga so 56th can you go yeah very good so krishna here the key word in this is the first word sarva karmaani sarva karmaanya pisada kurvano madhya pashraya okay okay sarva karmaanya pisada is whatever work you are doing if you can do that work but offer it to me become conscious of me if you do it in this way you will come to me this is a direct call for bhakti yoga and this this same call is continued and elaborated as krishna moves forward and he says yes you have your nature but don't don't simply act according to your nature act according to your nature in my service so a brahmana is meant to be brahmana but don't just be a brahmana for being a brahmana sake be a brahmana for serving me if you do this you will attain me and then after that he says moves forward in 1863 says now i have given the message think about what you want to do as arjun becomes deeply lost in thought then krishna's heart overflows with compassion and he says oh arjun i'll tell you what is the highest truth and then he says sarva dharman parityajya mam ekam sharanam vraja aham tvam sarva papebhyo mokshayishami ma shuchah so there vishwa chakra thakur says that if we consider the bhagavad gita to be like a treasure chest you know, the treasure chest has a upper upper wooden covering a lower wooden covering and in between there is the real jewels so like that the upper and the lower are the outer the top six chap the last six chapters and the first six chapters and the real treasure is in between but suppose like a big wooden chest in which uh, people may not even take the trouble to check open and what check and what so to, just to indicate to them on the cover say if there are two jewels that are put in the upper cover then oh there are jewels on embedded on the cover of this chest there might be so more many more over here so let's dig in let's open and find out so like that on the upper cover of the treasure chest these two jewels are put these are 65 and 66 verse 65 is manmanabha 66 is sarva dharma an parityajya and in after that krishna gives the phala shruti he says just surrender to me after he says that then I, i actually last time if you remember i had come and i spoken on the last 7 8 verses of the bhagavad gita in sanjaya's instruction i had spoken so what is happening krishna first says you preach this message and you will be very dear to me now somebody may say preaching is very difficult i can't do that then krishna says okay then you study this message it's like say somebody has fallen in a well and somebody from outside the well says okay you just catch this rope and i'll pull you out the person says hey, you know if i catch my arms will pain so much then the person says okay i'm sending this rope down there's a knot over here you just tie it around your waist and i will pull you out you don't have to do anything but then the person says oh but you know if i tie it around my waist my waist will pain so much because of that so krishna says first you just preach that is like you hold on to the rope i'll pull you out if you can't krishna says you just study but somebody says i can't even study it's very difficult to understand mm-hmm. somebody says i can't even hold on to the rope and it is tied so what krishna says is okay i will send a rope which is tied to a nice big bucket you sit in that bucket i'll pull you out <laughs> <laughs> so like that that's 1871 krishna says you just hear my message if you hear you will come to me 
But unfortunately, what happens is while being pulled out, we turn the bucket upside down and fall down. <laughs> <laughs> so Krishna is offering his mercy over here and then he asks can you in 72 then he asks have you understood clearly and Arjuna replies Karishye Vachnam Tav he says my illusion has gone and I have understood and I'll do your will so this Karishye Vachnam Tav the starting question and concluding answer they both indicate the universality of the Gita that the starting question was in 2.7 Pruchami Tvam Dharma Sammudha Cheta I want to know what is Dharma and the conclusion in 1873 is Karishye Vachnam Tava Arjuna is not saying I will fight because fighting is yes he is going to fight but the central point of the Bhagavad Gita is not to fight the war the central point of the Bhagavad Gita is to actually do God's will at that point doing God's will meant fighting but for different people in different situations doing God's will can mean different things the essence of the Gita is that you should do God's will and then after that so this is where the Gita ends and Sanjay gives his understanding. So the next five verses tell about Sanjay's gratitude. Oh, because of Yasa, I heard this. It was so wonderful. Such an amazing conversation. So 74th verse, he appreciates the conversation. 75th verse, he appreciates the person by whose grace he got to hear the conversation. That is Yasa Dev. Then 76th. He appreciates the result of the con 76 and 7. He appreciates the result of the con result result of the conversation for him. One is that he remembers Krishna's words and he remembers Krishna's form, and by that he becomes thrilled. And then finally, 78th verses. His indirect answer to Yudhishthira to the question of the Trashtra. That is the question of the Trashtra was. What, what what happened at the Kurukshetra war? So he says that, he doesn't say that what happened in that literal sense, he says, wherever there is dharma, there will be victory. So if we see, the Bhagavad Gita has a beautiful symmetry to it. The starting question and the last, the starting verse has a question, the last verse is a prophecy which is the answer. And thus there is a, a cyclicity to it. And it's interesting, dharma, dharma kshetre kurukshetre. So the first word, uh, first, um, first verse, first word is dharma, and what is that dharma? So the last word's answer is so if it is dharma kshetra, the kurukshetra. So the indication over there is that the war is happening, but it is happening in dharma kshetra, and the last word is answering that wherever there is the dharma, wherever there is dharma, there will be victory. Yatra Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna Yatra Tatra Partho Dhanurut Yatra Partho Dhanurut Tatra Shri Rujaya Bhutir Dhruvani Tirma Tirmama That on that Dharma Kshetra in the Kurukshetra the wherever there is Dharma that's where there is going to be victory and where is Dharma? The essence of Dharma is where the soul and the super soul are together where Yatra Yogeshwara Krishna God who can do anything and the soul who is ready to do anything for God who is ready to fight. So Arjuna's surrender is that he is ready to fight even against his venerable elders for the sake of God. So God who can do anything and the soul who is ready to do anything. When both of them come together, that is where victory will be. And it is with this declaration that the Bhagavad Gita concludes. So thank you very much. I quickly summarize what I spoke and then we can stop. So I spoke today about the summary of chapters 15 to 18. 15 chapter talks about the upside down meta tree metaphor. And I talked about how illusion, nature of illusion can be explained through various metaphors. We can have dream, we can have sleep, we can have virtual reality or watching a TV or movie and we can have an upside down tree which indicates reflection. The point is that there is something be more real than the reality that we are experiencing right now. And what is the relationship between material reality and the spiritual reality? That's the fifth, what 15 chapter talks about. Essentially, it's about how this world is a reflection, how we struggle while we are in this reflection, while being in this reflection, how we can understand that there is some reality beyond. And then how by Vedic knowledge we can pursue that reality. That's what the 15 chapter talks about. 16 chapter talks about the those who are at the top and the bottom of this tree, the divine and the demoniac natures. And mainly it's about, Krishna has talked about the divine qualities many times in the past. 
so he focuses on their demoniac their qualities their activities and their mentality and we talked about how both uh, those who are on top of the hierarchy in any kind of power structure they can dominate and destroy others and that is demoniac or those who want to destroy the hierarchy itself that can also be demoniac because what will be there will be nothing that will be result of that nothing constructive will remain and then whatever be our nature if we follow shastra accordingly then the ungodly side of our nature can be regulated and the godly side can be developed so are people innately good or innately bad they say we have a innate potential for good but we also have a uh, also a innate propensity for bad and the potential for good will not come out automatically it has to be it has to struggle to come forth through the propensity for vice fighting against it and then beyond that we talked about in the 17th chapter about how do we understand people who are not explicitly following shastra we have to understand their shraddha what is the level of shraddha and they just see through their actions basically uh, what is the level of consciousness that can be seen we can be seen by what food they eat and how they interact with their own bodily circle that is tapa how they interact with the social circle that is dana and how they interact with their uh, larger environmental circle that is the yakya and by that we can understand the level of consciousness and om tat sat is basically indicating invoke invoking the divine while doing whatever we are doing so that it can be spiritualized it can be for higher purpose the 18th chapter talks about not action nor renunciation but renunciation in action and how can renunciation be done in action for that it analyzes action in various ways and explains the components of action we discussed the five components can be understood as the soul the soul's interaction with the subtle body that is the cheshta the soul's interaction with the, the gross body and the world outside that is the karanam the senses then the setting in the outer world itself that is the adhisthana and then ultimately daiva the will of destiny then we talked about how the 18th chapter says it analyzes kar, kar, karma karta and jnana and then Uh, buddhi dhruti and sukha as various components of action to understand how we can act in the higher modes act act in goodness then in by acting in such a way with deta- detachment one can rise from karma yoga through gyan yoga to bhakti yoga or one can directly practice bhakti yoga the bhagavad gita concludes with a call for the direct practice of bhakti yoga and it arjun accepts that and he says not that i will fight but i will do your will and sanjay gives his conclusion describing how he is deeply absorbed in krishna's message and krishna's words and declaring the uh, and reiterating as a prophecy the essential message of the gita that when the when the when god who is ready to do anything who is capable of doing anything and the soul who becomes ready to do anything for god when they come together then that is where dharma and victory will be thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna shrimad bhagavad gita ki jai श्री प्रभुपाद की गौर भक्त की जय गौर प्रेमान